Hey, hello everybody, Scott Golden here with Pro Wrestling Logic, and uh, we continue our TNT Tuesday Night Titans YouTube series, review series, and we're going to go into just being a couple of weeks away from WrestleMania 1, uh, the 22nd of May, of uh, March, <laughs> not May, March, uh, 1985, and uh, we're just a couple of weeks away from WrestleMania 1, probably biggest uh, event in the history of the company at the time, and there are, are some things that kind of move us towards being ready for the event, uh, about two weeks away, just a little over at, at that point. Um, so we open with Andre the Giant talking about his giantism and his increasing size, Andre talking about having size 22 feet, the fact he's still growing, and just think about that, I mean, this guy who passed away only what, uh, this is 1985, he passes away in 93, so he's only, he's less than 10 years away from passing um, at this point, and his body is still growing. I mean, that's pretty major if you think about it, and so and he's talking about that. He's talking about kind of the challenges of being a giant. Uh, then we see a clipped version of a match between him and Ken Patera from January of that year of 85. Um, Patera does his best to take the giant down in every possible way. doesn't get very far, however. Uh, instead, focuses on uh, trying to take him down, but doesn't get where he needs to get. And Andre is attacked by Bobby Heenan. Heenan enters via the top rope. And, I mean, the giant just paint brushes Bobby the Brain Heenan. Uh, of course, Heenan throwing some, some really good working shots here. Bobby is so good at everything he does. Uh, and, and you'll literally hear me say this hundreds of times. Closest thing to, to hero that I have in life is the late, great Bobby the Brain Heenan. If not for Bobby, this channel wouldn't exist. If not for Bobby, my career in, in speaking publicly wouldn't exist. If not for Bobby, my love for wrestling wouldn't exist. So Bobby it was, it was a major influence in my life in, in numerous ways. Uh, in any event, we go back to the TNT studios. Andre's talking about WrestleMania. Um, and they talk about the stakes of the match. And so... By this point, Stud had put up ten or fifteen thousand dollars in the Body Slam Challenge aspect of the contest at WrestleMania. Probably the third match from the top, behind the women's match and the main event, and so it's you know a big deal. Uh, but they make it even bigger deal here as uh, Stud and Heenan and everybody associated with the Heenan family said that Andre should put something up too, since they're putting up money. And he he is dared here, or encouraged by Vince McMahon by proxy of the Heenan family, to put up his career, which he agrees to do. McMahon makes a comment, basically, is he sure that he can handle this? And Andre <laughs> takes his paw, and, I mean, he doesn't have hands. He has paws. He wraps it around Vince's uh, coat and tie and just lifts him off the ground with one hand and <laughs> says no one is to insult him or challenge him in that way. Sends him back down, and I mean, Vince's facial expressions, if you've never seen Vince McMahon manhandled or palmed, I don't care the giant does so here, worth going out of your way just to see that. Uh, anyway, we move on to the Intercontinental Champion, Greg the Hammer Valentine, with his new manager, otherwise known as Jimmy the Mouth of the South Heart. Of course, Valentine, up to this point, or up into the last few months anyway, managed by... Captain Lou Albano, till Albano aligns with the good guy side of the locker room. And so Hart is brought in, of course, brought in from Memphis. You know, this makes me think there's so much in the uh, nature of the way that these that these guys work together. Uh, you know, I mean, JYD comes from Mid-South. Ted DiBiase in the next few years comes from Mid-South. Uh, Jesse Ventura and Hulk Hogan come from the AWA. It made me wonder, and I'd love if, if fans older than I or more seasoned than I in the pre-expansion period, did Vince McMahon ever try to get one of the Von Erichs at this time period? So between, let's say, summer of 83 and WrestleMania 1, and did he try and get Jerry Lawler from Memphis at that time? Because I think, I mean, if you're really trying to kill the territories, getting a Von Erich or Lawler at that time would have been monumental, even if you, as certainly in Lawler's case, I don't think that was Vince's cup of tea, but if you're really trying to be 
a progressive predatory business. I know, progressive and predatory, that sounds weird. But uh, anyway, if that's what you're trying to do, that's the way to do it. Anyway, um, so we go into a Greg the Hammer Valentine matchup. Uh, the match with Jim Powers. Of course, Powers is a guy that's around the WWF for probably the next almost decade. I think he leaves in 93, 94. And as someone who grew up going to uh, New England-based A-shows of the, of the WWF brand from 89 through 96, I think I went to a couple more events after 96, but I stopped going monthly in 96, that much I remember, um, and it's a weird reason why, people can laugh at me if they want to, but there was an incident at one of the events where the fireworks around the ring almost caught on fire, and I knew this because uh, I was familiar with the fire marshal <coughs> who went to the building, I knew him away from uh, that role. And he, he said they were literally seconds away from catching on fire. And my teenage self, uh, certainly being wheelchair-bound, had no interest in, in burning to death, becoming a crispy critter at a WWF show. And so I, I boycotted any shows where they would have fire and pyro because it just wasn't for me. Anyway, sideline there. Um, but Jim Powers is a guy that I saw him and Steve Lombardi, the Brooklyn Brawler, wrestle literally probably 10 to a dozen times over the years, have the exact same basic match, and um, they were the opener, uh, in at least in the New England area. I don't know if it was the same in other areas of the country, that other areas of the country had a certain opener, but good gosh, Powers and Lombardi, not a match I'd like to see again, although every once in a while I'll come across it on YouTube or on the network or somewhere, and it's like, hey, I remember this from... From being a kid, uh, it's kind of interesting. But obviously, Valentine gets uh, the majority of the offense here. Very slow, methodical way. It's interesting because a lot of people criticize Greg Valentine. And certainly, in today's climate, he'd never have gotten nearly as over as he did. But Valentine was such a methodical storyteller. So masterful in that way. And I think people take him for granted. Anyway, we go off to Piper's Pit with... Roddy Piper and Paul Orndorff, and they're mocking Mr. T and Hogan. You know, uh, both guys are basically saying that T does not belong, uh, that he's going to get outclassed and, and out-wrestled and outmanned at WrestleMania, and uh, Piper's saying that Hogan's ducking him and that Hogan's a paper champion and the like. Uh, McMahon interviews all three components. I, I always wondered, and I think it's just because I have a personal preference for Bob Orton Jr. over uh, Paul Orndorff, you know, and I, I would love for somebody who is is more familiar with the rise of Paul Orndorff uh, through Florida and then into WWF land, show me matches of Paul's that were not with Hulk Hogan that are really outstanding matches. I just never get into Paul Orndorff. It's funny. I like him in WCW a bit more. I loved him in Smoky Mountain Wrestling because he was in a smaller environment, but his WWF run just never clicked with me for the level of push he got, and I'd love for someone to educate me and change my mind on that. So if you're a, a strong Orndorff fan, please feel free to, to recommend things for me to watch. I might even review them here if uh, it's episodic enough to do so. Anyway, uh, Sarah the Soothsayer, remember her? Otherwise known as uh, Miss, Miss Cleo Light. Uh, she's back and she's predicting WrestleMania and it's not a prediction that uh, uh, is very clear and it basically makes fun of intuitive slash psychic work and I think this is, I think the next episode, because I'm, I'm all the way up to August in, in my watching, but I think the next episode is where um, Piper calls her out because she predicts uh, better things for T and um, T and Hogan than, than she does for Piper's trio. And obviously, Roddy Piper doesn't take well to that. Um, then we, we see uh, the U.S. Express addressing their WrestleMania match. Obviously, they're the champions going into Mania. They are going to uh, take on Volkov and The Sheik, who they have a match with here. 
Broke off in the sheet, caused damage, uh, trying to burn. I uh, believe it's Barry Windham in the match. I mean, the match between these four is kind of a styles clash. Um, Sheik is, so at this point, not so much in the AWA and, and prior to his WWF run, but and, and certainly he gets even less mobile <laughs> as the years go by. He's still pretty good here, but um, by 91, he's just... In the Colonel Mustafa run, he's he's hard to watch, but um, you know Volkov is 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 powerful and and the like. And uh, actually, that that match is 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 from another episode. It just popped into my head. I you know what I did. I blended my notes. My apologies. Anyway, the match this week for them is Rusty Brooks and Charlie Fulton. Fulton, we see a lot of um, the champions look strong here. They're obviously you know, very, very focused on certainly getting, and, and I always felt that, that they did more for Barry Windham in this role than they did for uh, Mike Rotundo. It just seems like if somebody's going to speak, speak and it's not Captain Lou Albano, it's Barry Windham. Windham actually more soft-spoken than he is in the Horseman run in later days. I think he didn't really find himself until the, NWA run, I mean, he is classic by 87, and to think that's two years removed from his uh, tag team championship run is kind of ironic, if you think about it. Anyway, they're plugging WrestleMania and uh, the fact that they will walk away champions. Final segment for this week, Hogan and T, they're shopping for healthy foods, they're, you know, looking around for things to do, we see them running the streets, we see them getting ready and uh the the people are primed everywhere they go you can just see people anticipating hogan and t to be the team to beat i i i just part of me wishes that i i was you know five years older and had started watching wrestling in 85 instead of 89 i think i, I really would have enjoyed watching episodically on a week-to-week -week basis rather than in a crash course way uh, the build to WrestleMania 1 through 4, um, which is going to be fun to do here, but it just, there's, I think, something to have been, having been a kid at the time or having been a, even a teenager at the time would have been interesting. And, and maybe if I'd been a little bit older during Hogan's uh, latter run after WrestleMania 3, I wouldn't have been a Hogan fan for the few years that I was. I don't know, but the fact of the matter remains... This build with Mr. T is a big, big thing, and certainly one of the most memorable things in all of professional wrestling, but uh, suffice to say, this is another one of the TNT reviews. I'll, keep, I'll encourage you to keep your feet on the ground, your mind in the moment. Till next time, everybody.